One of the greatest generals you've never heard of is a fellow by the name of Sulla. Sulla's full name, he's a Roman general, his full name was Lucas Cornelius Sulla. But along the way in his life, he, they would give you another name, a fourth name, if you did something amazing. Like if you were the, the Roman who conquered Germany, he got the name Germanicus. And so Sulla got another last name. His extra last name was Felix, uh, which is, translates as the fortunate or the lucky. And I want to tell you a little bit about the story about how did uh, such a, a name get applied? Why does, why does he get to be called lucky? In the year 81 BC, Sulla had just finished up a campaign in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. They, he had to retake what we now call the Dardanelles, what was then called the Hellespont. And it was the connection between the Black Sea and then the Aegean Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. And so if you wanted to control trade in the Mediterranean, you had to control the Hellespont. You could build an entire empire off of controlling this one little bit of land. And a fellow named Mithridates got a little bit too big for his britches, according to the Roman point of view, and uh, he took over the Hellespont, and so Sulla went out with his six legions, a legion is about 5,000 soldiers, and he took it back. Mithridates had a very bad day, and on his way back, something odd happened. Sulla's wife and children showed up. Now, if you're going to go fight a months-long campaign war, right, you don't take your wife and children. You leave them at home. It's a little bit dangerous. But the fact that they showed up told Sulla how dangerous it had gotten in Rome. The, the two political parties, the opt Optimates and the Populares, had gotten so, the, the fighting between them had gotten so tense that it was safer for his family to come be with him on campaign than to stay in Rome. They were that scared for their safety. And, and so what was the big deal? What was the fight over? The Optimates and the Populares were fighting over voting rights. Some things never change, right? They're fighting over voting rights. And, and we think of Italy today as Italy. That's, Italy doesn't exist as one consolidated thing for centuries. At this time, there was uh, Romans in, in, in Rome, and there's a bunch of other people, other ethnicities, other tribes. And all these other ethnicities and other tribes, they couldn't vote. They had no legal standing. If you did something wrong to them and they went to the police, the police would say, well, A, there wouldn't be police. But if the police did exist, the police would have said, are you a citizen? And they would have said no, and it would have been, sorry, right? So they had no political rights. And so the populares, as their name implies, are arguing that everyone on the Italian peninsula should have voting rights. Big deal, right? And the Optimates have been arguing that it should only be, voting rights should only be for the Romans. And Sulla has been an Optimate for all of his life. And so he is showing up with his, he leaves one legion behind to make sure Mithridates doesn't do anything unfortunate. And he takes five of his legions back with him and they show up on the east coast of, Rome, of uh, Italy. A and he has his five legions. They are the best trained, most, most battle-hardened, in-shape fighting force in existence at that moment. But 25,000 men versus 10 to 15 legions of untrained, but a lot of them, right? So all the populares are saying, you should have to vote. If you go out and say, you should have to vote, and will you fight for your right to vote? People say yes. And so the populares have, they have put together lots of legions. There are multiple armies waiting to take on Sulla because they want to vote, and Sulla historically, because he's an optimate, has said that they should not. And so Sulla shows up on the coast of Italy with his legions, he looks around and he says, one sentence, yes, I think they all should be able to vote, don't you? And with that one sentence, he avoids a decade of civil war. Right, what happens twice, not just once, but twice, is that Sulla leads his army, his five legions, up to an army being led by a popular general. 
And when, uh, the night before a battle, some of the legionaries in Sulla's uh, legions would go over and, and tell the other army, he wants you to vote. It's okay. And so all these people who were about to die for their right to vote, like the, the popular general woke up the next day ready to lead his legions in the battle, and he found out they'd all defected to Sulla. It happened twice. An entire army, like 30,000 people being told, he wants you to vote. And they would all say, Okay, and they'd go over and join Sulla. And, and so with that one sentence, right? Yeah, I think they should be able to vote. Sulla avoided a decade of civil war. Very cool guy. And, and part, part of why he, he gets this, uh, this, this new last name of Felix. Fortunate indeed. As I read Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, or any of Paul's letters for that matter, I think of that one sentence, right? What is the one sentence you speak to avoid massive conflict into a tense moment? Because that's what Paul is always writing into. Like, every time Paul writes a letter, it's because there's a problem. We don't have Paul's letter to the church at Corinth that says, hey, how's Sheila's kid doing? Like, how's the crop? Was it a good year? Did they get done with that project over in the forum? Right? We don't have Paul's letter to the church of Galatia just checking in to see how things are going. Every time Paul writes a letter, it's because someone has called the bishop. Right? Think, or the equivalent. There wasn't a bishop back then. There was Paul. But like, think of how bad do things have to be in this church before you're willing to call the bishop. Right? And that's, what, that, that's the situation Paul is always writing to. He is always writing to a church that has said, that's it, we cannot take this anymore, we have got to do something. And people start calling the bishop, except it's Paul. And Paul can't show up in person, Paul has to write a letter. He has to write a letter to a church that he knows is tense, is fighting, everyone's looking ahead, so because if you look to the side, you might make eye contact, so everyone's looking straight ahead. You ever been in a worship service like that? Yeah, I hope not. But everyone is really tense, and Paul knows that his letter is going to be read to a church that is fighting with itself, or else he wouldn't be writing them. And so he has to write th th this opening line. What's his first sentence that he's going to write so that people will chill and listen to him. This is an important first sentence. Here's his first sentence to the letter, to, uh, in the letter to the church at Colossae. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. And that's all one sentence. Paul is rather wordy. But it, it, Paul, this is what he, first Paul starts by announcing himself, right? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Not Paul, the random dude you're calling. Let me just remind you, why are you talking to me? You're talking to me because I am Paul, sent by Jesus for you. And uh, this is Paul and Timothy, our brother, because he knows Timothy is going to have to take over for him at some point. And, and so the, he's sort of getting, making sure people understand that Timothy is with him. And, and Jesus always sends out people two by two, Paul and Timothy, two by two. He says, Paul, I am writing you to you, the saints. You ever have your mama look at you and say, well, to me, it'd be, Andy, we're coons. We don't act like that, right? You ever have that happen, right? That's what Paul's doing here. Paul, to the saints, your saints. Remember, saints. Act like it. Saints, to the holy ones who are at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Right? Our Father. Not some people's Father and other people's Father. He's writing, saying, our Father. Remember, we're all family in this, right? We are all of one family. And he, he finishes up with that grace to you and peace. Now, grace to you and peace is not how you write letters in the first century. Like, we know how you write letters today. If I'm going to write a letter to you, how do you start writing a letter? Dear so-and-so, right? And even if you're writing to Frank, Frank, I would have a hard time writing Dear Frank, because Frank, you're a good man. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you're my good friend, but I don't think of you as my dear. But if I'd write him a letter, I'd still write Dear Frank, right? Because that's how you write a letter. And Paul follows the norms of how you write a letter. Like in the Roman times, you wrote a letter in a certain order, and Paul follows it. 
except at the beginning. Every time he starts the letter, and we heard all of them just a minute ago, they all sound the same, right? Paul always breaks convention when he starts a letter. Because the way you're supposed to start a letter is to say, greetings. That's not what he says. He says, grace to you and peace. And that phrase has a lot going on there. First, grace is a Greek idea. Right? Grace, the idea of grace, that, that you are beautiful, graceful, that you are graceful because God has made you beautiful. This is a Greek idea, the Greek focus on grace, gracefulness and beauty. And, and then peace. Peace it is the Jewish idea. Peace is how the Jews would talk to each other. Jew, it's a, for the Hebrew word uh, shalom. And it's, peace is not just that I'm not actively hitting you. Peace is being able to share a meal together. Peace is being real community. And, and so for Paul to say grace and peace is a lot like what Mr. Rogers does. Y'all remember Mr. Rogers, my personal hero, right? Mr. Rogers, in the middle of some of the most tense race moments in the history of our country, yeah, I don't know if you remember this, he gets in a wading pool, he, he's in a sweater, he takes his shoes off, puts his feet in a wading pool and says, oh, it's so hot outside. Isn't it so nice to cool off your feet? Oh, and he welcomes the new neighborhood cop onto the screen who's black, right? And he says, T take a sit, now, sit down next to me, officer, and, and why don't you take your shoes off and, and cool off your feet next to me? And so in the middle of some of the most tense moments in race in America, Mr. Rogers is sitting there with his white feet next to those black feet, and then he drives off the black feet, right? That was one gutsy fellow. Don't let the sweater confuse you. That man had guts. This is the same thing, right? In the first century, the major racial issue was between Jew and Greek, right? Later on, Paul will write, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. This is his opening salvo, right? Grace, Greek idea. Peace, Jewish idea. You are in this together. Even if you are Jew or Greek, you're in this together. Grace to you and peace. A lot going on there, isn't it? And it's not just that he's pulling together Jew and Gentile in his opening. It's the order that matters. It's grace to you and peace, which is different than saying grace and peace to you. And that, ma that, that wording, it really does make a difference. Grace to you is to say all the things God gives to you, right? Grace, free gift, all that God gives. That God has forgiven you, that God has accepted you, that God has accepted you as family, sent you out as disciples, given you community, created the church as its a gift for you, all the teaching and guidance that God offers us. Grace, that's all wrapped up in that. The, all that Jesus gives to you, grace be to you. And then peace. Right? If you want to have peace, first you accept the grace, grace to you, and then peace. Peace is the result of accepting what God gives. Then you have the peace, the fullness of life, the life as we are meant to live, literally living your salvation today. Live as a person transformed by grace, joy, peace. First we receive what God offers, and then we are at peace. Grace to you and peace. Couldn't you think of anything more powerful to wish for a person? Like if someone comes to you and wishes for you, grace to you and peace, could you stay angry at them? Right? I want you to have the best that God has ever given. I want you to have that. I want you to live a life that is full of the beginnings of your salvation. I want you to be a complete peace with everyone around you. Try arguing with that. Right? That's how he begins. And he will go on uh, to discuss all other hard matters. Right? And, and, but those hard matters always begin with, every one of those letters always begins with grace to you and peace. You can have grace and peace in the middle of tense times. It is that grace that will get you through to the peace. Now, Paul will then go on to discuss the hard matters. How do we handle this? How do we handle this issue or that issue? But this is the beginning. And it might be that that is an important thing for us to hold on to today. When you disagree with somebody, what's the first thing you say to them? 
Think about that. When you look at someone and you find yourself thinking, maybe you don't get hot like this, maybe it's just me. But I find myself looking at people sometimes and thinking, that was offensively stupid. You ever think that? Maybe you don't, maybe that's just me. But what I read Paul in here, what Paul reminds me of is when I'm looking at someone and thinking, ah, the next words out of my mouth better be something like this. Grace to you and peace. Because if I start with anything else, how is it going to go? Right? I think Paul teaches a lot with just how he starts this letter. Grace to you and peace. I can't think of better words to begin with than when we disagree. Or whatever it is that we can say that gets across the same point. Over the next weeks, we will look at this letter, the letter to the church at Colossae, Colossians. And I encourage you to take a gander at it. We'll read about a chapter a week. But I want to start by saying the same thing that Paul did. Grace to you. May you be full of all that God can give. And may it transform your life so that you are at peace. Total peace, peace with those around you, peace with the Lord who loves you. Amen.